Well, g'day, Max here again. Welcome back to the shop. So this is part two in the series of our angle plate build that we're doing. So part one, we did the preliminary machining on the outsides. And so today we're going to cover all of the edges and then machine as far in as we can on the insides. The insides isn't really necessary, but you could get into situations where it is convenient to have the inside of an angle plate machine. So let's get you in and we'll just go through. It's just a very quick setup. There's nothing too accurate about it. We'll get our tool and the vertical spindle. Let's crack on. So if I can just interrupt proceedings here for a second. I've just gone through and all of the comments from uh, part one in the series. And there's been a few questions, and I thought I'd just go through them on here. And I've, so I've just noted down a couple of points. Um, one was regarding braces, putting a support brace in uh, while we were machining. Um, and for sure, that would have stopped that chatter issue straight away. Two reasons why I did not want to go that way. One of them, there's clearance up under the spindle. Um, I was coming up, I would have been coming up very close and it might have just fitted, it might not have just fitted. And already having the machine set up, or sorry, the job set up in the machine, I did not want to take the job out of the machine to weld braces. I'm not at this stage doing any welding on jobs on this machine. Uh, I'll show you the reason why. This machine has some semi-automatic functions. It's a controlled by this panel here. So depending on which way or which orientation all this is switched, um, this will give you semi-automatic table movements. So although possibly, like I am no electrical engineer and it completely baffles me, I think all of this part of the board would probably be all right. But as we get lower down, we get into this sort of stuff here. These things here, all right, they're just fuses and, and transformers down there. I'm pretty sure this is all to do with the semi-automatic movements. It's a very primitive setup and it's, it's like the unknown delving into the great unknown so i don't want to r run the risk of anything electrically going wrong by um, welding on this machine even if i do put the earth on carefully it's just something at this stage i d do not want to uh <laughs> happen and the second reason why i did not want to machine these in a braced condition this is 300 grade plate. When you machine it, more often than not, it's susceptible to stress movement. I machined a big long piece in here the other day. It was a meter long. It was flame cut both sides. This has been flame cut. It was 100 millimeters wide and 32 mil thick plate, same as this. Now, after machining either side, when I unclamped it, it bent about half a millimetre, 20 thou in the middle, and that was a metre long when I turned it up on edge. It didn't bend the thin way, it bent edge on the thick. I'll go and get it. This is uh, a bit over one third of it. So that edge was machined, that edge was machined. It didn't move that way move that way. So, I did not want these braced and then take the braces off and have movement occur. So that's why I work through the processes. Um, we have a lot of, as machinists, we have a lot of tricks up our sleeves to get around certain situations. And so we were just going by process of elimination, eliminating what was causing that chatter and in the end we got there and that's how you do it um, putting 
using additional engineered or engineering controls in place, whatever, to eliminate problems. It's not always the first um, place to run to. So that's why it was all machine, no bracing. And then I knew when they were finished, after my finished cut, the faces were still square and there was no stress to be relieved after the braces were removed. So that's that one covered. Okay, why was I not cutting in one direction? We've only just got this machine fired up. If for cutting in one direction on a face mill, that's something that I do quite often in the bridge port. So all the cuts will come around. When I'm chasing accuracy, that's the method that I use. We're still learning the accuracy and the idiosyncrasies of this machine. So I'll cut every which way and I want to see how the machine um, reacts. So that's why that. Uh, feed delay, I think I've already explained that, which I have to work out. That's to do with the switches. So when I turn the feed off, the feed instantly stops, but the feed motor carries on for another few seconds. And until that stops, it prevents me from doing any other movement or even shutting off the spindle on the machine. Uh, there was a comment, why I was not cutting down towards the table to reduce chatter? Well, that makes no difference because the chatter was on the other leg up the top. Uh, in this video, when I'm doing these edges, I cut both ways, down towards the table and coming up from the bottom. Makes no difference whatsoever in this machine. It's, it's got enough weight in this table to handle it. It's a big machine, it's four and a quarter ton. Uh, why don't I fly cut them? <laughs> That's an easy one. I do not own a fly cutter. <laughs> The only fly cutting I've ever done is putting a tool bit in a boring head. Um, my industry past experience, everything's done with face mills and you don't, it's, uh, fly cutters are not a thing used in industry or at least in the industries that I worked, which is general machining and repair and that sort of thing. Um, hobbyists love them, but yeah, I always, my go-to is always a face mill. Um, why didn't I do them in the shaper? That was my original intention for this whole project. Um, but as I've said, I need them, I need them yesterday. Um, if we'd done this in the shaper, if I'd started it a week ago, we'd still be doing it. The shaper is way too slow. This will take off in a split second. What well, It will take a shaper 10 minutes to do. Hence, that's why shapers were pretty well put redundant overnight with the, when these face mills and indexable tooling came out. They're still a good machine and we'll still be doing a lot of jobs in our shaper because um, I like to use it. Okay, last one. Um, <clears throat> people think because I have this long extension coming out of here with the cutter, that's going to cause chatter, not in this machine. These have got huge spindle bearings and this is a big solid extension. It's a proper extension. Um, running this small cutter on it, no problem whatsoever. I could load this up to its maximum depth of cut of seven millimeters on this cutter and she won't bat an eyelid. You won't get chatter from this. So that's the way it is, hence, I will be getting a longer extension with a smaller cutter, as I said, just in case we need to machine the insides of these, and I might use it on other projects. So, <laughs> Anyway, I hope that um, answers some of the questions a bit clearer than me trying to do it in the, in the comments. So, Anyway, back to the video. So just for a quick, simple setup, we just sort of have our plates sort of sitting something like there. We'll just use this uh, straight edge. We can just line them up and I can sneak the straight edge up to the T-slot and just 
feel down with my fingers into this t the ledge on the T-slot. That's all we need to do. Now I could, if I wanted to, indicate these in and use our horizontal spindle to machine this edge and then swap the cutters over and use our vertical to machine this edge. It's one setup, but it's quicker and easier just to stick with the vertical spindle. There's no, nothing we've got to indicate in here. It's just a straight cut across the top, flipping back, re-clamp, straight cut across the top. And then we'll, we'll deal with the ends after that. So that's the way we're going to proceed. Uh, just set the toe clamp flat, hold it down with your finger, come up to the slot, then come up one groove. So we'll get this cutter out of the machine, I'll put the machine in a low gear. I must get another one of these cutters. This is an 80 mil, I might get a 100 mil. And that way I can leave the 100 in this uh, holder here. And run the 80 in the vertical spindle okay now we need to eject this okay so we have to put our dummy adapter in so we can still run the machine because of the uh, this will allow the interlock to be overridden and it will think there's a tool in place. Unfortunately, I have to make up some more of these bayonet style fittings for our NT series adapters. Um, I've only got the one of them. So I'll just go and swap this one into here has a 20 millimeter thread I think it's a 20 millimeter thread in these in these ones and uh, we'll get this one popped back in okay it's our adapter back in it's a painful system but grips on like that we'll suck it in Okay, that's it. So, at least two. It, it prevents you from being lazy and, and leaving the spindle open and the spindle and the mechanism inside for grabbing the tool. It keeps all the, all the chips and rubbish out from going in, so it does serve a purpose. Unfortunately, yeah, we've got to do it the man, um, manual way for the vertical spindle and I can't reach that with the spanner, so 
Let me just go and get something to stand on. Okay. So this machine has a circular T-slot under here. And that's for, well I haven't got it, but there's another head that, um, a right angle head bolts on here and secures to the circular T-slot. The right size Allen key would help. Let's make sure that's got enough threads in that. Yeah, no, that's fine. So that bang you heard on the floor was... <laughs> My cheetah bar. Just give this a nip. Like that. Okay. I just plugged our DRO in to see if it still powers up. It's an old Mitz Toyo uh, linear scale DRO, three axis. So I don't know why the other one's not lit up. I, I can't honestly remember if it ever worked properly or not before. And I have the scales off um, for uh, when I was working on the machine. So I'll have to refit all the scales and hopefully we'll get it. Uh, we'll get some life out of it. So I was just looking at this cutter. It's a new arbor. I've noticed the mounting cap screw sits lower than the inserts. <laughs> well, that's uh, generally never a good thing. So let's uh, rectify either the cap screw or the washer. Oh, that was easy. I just used the, the mounting hardware off our arbor from the horizontal spindle. And yeah, uh, tucks up inside nicely. Just something to be aware of. Let me just pull up there, there's a couple of excess blobs of grease coming out the spindle. Okay, I just had to wipe down a bit of excess grease from Olga's spindle here. Uh, due to the fact that it's, this had a large amount of dry grease in, I did throw a bit of extra lubricant in it. And that's all mixing with the dried stuff in it. Um, slowly coming out. Um, I do need to pull this vertical head off, strip it down and go through it. Um, but anyway, yeah, she's a oh, Olga. She's a bit of a squirter in the morning with a with the vertical spindle when you first fire it up, and then she settles down a bit and just um, she'll just suppulate a little bit of grease out for the remainder of the day. Okay, we need to find our high spot so we don't go ploughing into a, a high spot. <laughs>
Okay, we are getting a full clean up here across the plates. So we'll just do a half a millimetre cut. We'll bring our um, table feed up. We were running on 500 millimetres a minute. We'll come up to um, 800 millimetres, or uh, 630 millimetres a minute. And a half a millimetre um, cut. Relock the table. Okay, here we go. Not too bad. Yeah, no, that's good. I'll get these deburred and flipped up and we'll do the other edge. Um, with this machine, it is a bit painful, the delay. When I turn the uh, feed off, there's that uh, few second delay while the feed motor still keeps running. And while that's still running, there's nothing I can do. I just have to wait till it goes through its time cycle of a few seconds um, before it, it will allow me to do any other movements. So that's something I'm going to look at and investigate why it does that and if there's anything I can do to, to shorten the time delay up on it. So yeah, I'll get these deburred and we'll get them flipped over. Right, we'll go through again, find our high spot. So I'll have to get some better lighting set up for this machine. So we've got where it's been flame cut here. I just want to get rid of that. And um, <laughs> Mike from Texas. Well, I did sharpen it. <laughs> and we're just running through on two millimeter um, cuts. I have knocked the feed back to uh, 400 millimeters per minute. And we're staying on uh, 800. Uh, yeah, 800 RPM. So let's take another cut. Okay, last cut. Brought our feed up to 630. We're only going to do a half a mil depth of cut. We might bring our, let's try our revs. We'll bring it up to uh, 11 and 20.
Okay, that's good. We'll get that deburred. Yeah, it feels nice. So we'll give it a, a bit of file action, knock these ragged edges off. And then I think we'll get set up. Possibly we'll, we may look at doing the ends. Actually, I should have done that first cut uh, with them back to back set up like this as well. You're only cutting half of the distance. So. <laughs> Never thought about it at the time. Okay. Right, let's sort out our next setup so we can machine these edges. So I've decided to go back to the horizontal spindle. Figuring it's going to be the easiest way to, to machine either end of these angle plates. So we just indicated this one in. Um, And we're in a good position so we can then just push this one up against it once I've moved my indicator we'll put a tool makers clamp on the top and just clamp this other one straight down and we can do both at once so I can just line these up with my fingers pull it hard against this one and we just use a uh, tool makers clamp on either end <laughs> When they decide to play the game, they lighten it. Okay, and we'll set up our strap clamps on the other piece. But to see how this end one's gonna gonna go, it might interfere with the top of the machine. So this style of milling machine. It's a ram type milling machine, hence the ram, as compared to your standard configuration of a horizontal mill with a bolt on vertical head. So this has the four mounting holes here uh, for a standard type vertical head. <clears throat> but a lot of people say, yeah, they're not as um, use useful as they look because the head here can often get in the way of the horizontal spindle. And that, that's true, but you can fold it up out the way. I haven't sussed out yet the hassle, how much is involved to remove it until we go to do our work on it. It's possibly just these four bolts, I'm not sure yet, something we'll have to investigate further down the track. The advantage is it gives you um, very good um, Z direction height, um, as opposed to your standard type milling machine with a, a bolt on vertical head. Um, another advantage of this style too, you can easily flip between horizontal and uh, vertical. So they, each style has their own advantage and disadvantage. So we'll get this cutter set up in the horizontal spindle and we'll take our cut along the front. Okay, we're looking good, all clamped up. And I did have to swing the vertical head up out of the way just to clear the top, but that's no problem. Okay, I found a, uh, another light of another machine light. So 
gives you a bit more light to see. So I'll do this clip and then I better review it in case it's one of the lights that strobes with the camera. So let's take a clean up cut along this entire area. So we'll just take a, a quick, um, very light clean up cut and instead of going up and down I'm just going to traverse backwards and forwards. We'll come up to um, 1250. Just about half a mil, that'll be fine.
Yeah, well, that was a pretty big half a mil cleanup cut, but it came out really good. That's exactly what we want. All right, we'll get this swapped around and we'll do the other side. Messy little buggers, these uh, milling machines, aren't they? Just throw the crap everywhere. I'll get this uh, set back up for the other side and bring you back. So basically, I'm going to leave it still clamped on the top and I'll just rotate the whole um, thing around 180 degrees, indicate it in and reclamp it. Okay, that's um, close enough. She drops off a couple of hundredths of a millimetre just in this last bit here. Alright, we can dispense with this. Ready to rock and roll again. So it's just a repeat. Uh, sorry, a repeat of what we've just done on the other side. So we'll just go backwards and forwards. I think for for this side rather than up and down and across. Um. Right. Let's hook into side two. So let her rip. Tater a chip. A little bit there in the corner to still clean up. So I'll take, I'll move you back. I'll take the remaining cuts off here and another two millimeter roughing cut. And I think we'll be, should be about there.
Okay, so we'll just do a 0.5 millimeter uh, finish cut. Bring our revs up to a thousand. Uh, bring our feed up back up to uh, we were on 400 millimeters a minute then. We'll bring it up to 500. Oh, actually, we'll go to 6.30. Okay, our camera cut out there. I guess Samsung S21 Galaxy Electrics and Russian milling machine Cold ball milling machine electrics all came out of the same friggin' basket. You'd think nowadays you'd, they'd make something electronic that actually worked. Still, <laughs> it's the way of the world. If it worked, they'd never make any more of them, would they? Globalization. All right, I'll get this um, D bird and uh, we'll work out our plan of attack regarding what we're going to do, if anything, to the insides. <laughs> Might have to make a new intro for the channel. Got enough chips there. Set them in resin as, as um, coasters and sell them. Okay, that's as far as we need go on this for now. Um, it looks good. Our weld looks good. It can't seem to see any porosity, or at least not by the naked eye anyway, considering the amount of welding that is in this area, especially just here. So, we'll work out now our plan of attack on what we're going to do with the insides, if anything at this stage. As I said, I need to get these drilled and I need to get them set up for their job. Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and mark out two holes in each plate for the time being. Uh, these will be 16mm clearance holes um, to suit the mounting hardware. Uh, for this machine so it's just four holes I'll turn around I'll do them off camera and then we'll bring this video to a close <laughs> all right just four holes done off camera uh, the reason for that is I'm going to introduce to you our Alfred Herbert quick change tooling and our radial arm drill which has been sitting over the back there. <laughs> so I only just plugged that in yesterday. I wasn't even sure if the thing worked. So I wanted to keep the Herbert tooling for a separate video and this is a perfect opportunity. As for the rest of the holes on the angle plate, top with the holes and the slots we're going to do later on, I can't afford to spend the time on this part at the moment. So I'm just doing the bare necess necessity to make them functional. As for the holes on this side, I do, my next job is to make a adapter plate because these are way too small for their intended use. I need an adapter plate that comes up <laughs> like that high and like that wide. And these will support that adapter plate. That method of doing it like that means I can it opens up the opportunities for these angle plates to get used I don't need a separate set of really big angle plates whereas I can just bolt adapt the plates to the set here so kill two birds with one stone so as far as machining on the inside I thought about doing it on the shaper and I don't know that may still happen if I have spare time up my sleeve when we do the slots in them. So these will be readdressed. In the interim, I will buy a extension spindle for the milling machine and a smaller base mill so we can just reach in and do it with the extension spindle. Anyway, um, cheers. Thanks for watching. Sorry for the short video, but it's just the way it worked out. It was not intentional, so thanks.